participating. Uh, so this paper is joint with Nung Wong. Uh, Nung is actually online as well. Uh, I told Nung he should present. I have no idea why he uh, forced me to present, but uh, we have both of us to answer uh, the, the, the question for you. And then Jin Chang Yang, uh, our colleague at uh, the Shanghai University of Finance and Economics. Um, all right. So uh, let me start with a, a, just, you know, I think a couple of uh, obvious premises that probably most of you guys uh, already believe. Uh, so first, um, you know, climate change, I think, let's say over the last five to 10 years, I think now there's a lot of, uh, there, there's a decent amount of consensus that uh, climate change is making weather disasters more severe, uh, according to the most recent report from the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, so, you know, two examples are the increased frequency and severity of the uh, hurricanes, uh, and of course, I put the U.S. also, uh, the Western U.S. wildfires uh, have, have both of these sets of disasters have been linked to uh, climate change. Uh, we also know as economists that the welfare loss of, of these disasters are, are likely to be high, okay? And, and, and the reason is, is twofold. First, uh, these, these disaster events have, have a big tail loss element, so for instance, uh, the Atlantic housing, you know, uh, you can get tail events on one to two percent uh, uh, of capital stock once every uh, 40 years. Uh, and um, also, if you work with consumption disaster models, uh, Nung has, has a paper with Bob Hendike that, that's very good, uh, that kind of makes this point, uh, that if you're looking at uh, risk-averse agents and you're, they're basically facing what are essentially these sort of permanent tail losses, right, that's going to generate uh, a huge desire uh, to want to uh, mitigate and, and to avoid these types of losses, okay? Uh, most of the climate economics uh, literature has mostly uh, focused on emissions control and carbon taxes at the global level, right? And, and uh, the problem with that, of course, is that, you know, even if these, these, these types of controls and taxes are implemented, which is sort of a fairly big if, uh, they won't actually help with mitigating these disasters right, uh, uh, for decades, really, right? Uh, you know, so uh, our view is that regional level disaster mitigation, uh, such as seawalls, for instance, in the context of, of, of hurricanes or land use zoning in the context of wildfires, is going to have to play a major role going forward uh, as we adapt uh, uh, to uh, disasters in the age of climate change. So what determines mitigation? Uh, what is the welfare loss with and without optimal mitigation? Uh, and, and what are the tax and asset pricing implications, right? So our, our, our plan is to tackle um, all three sets of questions uh, in this paper. So what our model does is, is to um, have, a, have a, a regional, thinking, thinking about sort of a regional level uh, uh, mitigation where uh, mitigation essentially is spending out of consumption and investments today uh, that will limit fat tail damages to capital stock in the future. Okay, so that's the technology uh, that we're going to model. Uh, disasters in our model are going to arrive exogenously, right? So the point is, you know, uh, emissions controls or carbon taxes are meant to deal with cutting down on disaster arrivals uh, somewhere in the distant future. Uh, but that's not what we're going to be addressing. We're going to be addressing that these, these disasters are still going to be coming uh, at some rate. And uh, what, what mitigation does is once the disasters arrive, it's gonna limit uh, these damages, i.e. You know, that's sort of what a seawall is, 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 is meant to do. Uh, and, and the spending uh, by, by mitigating these fat tail damages condition on arrival, of course, uh, is gonna limit the uh, expected losses uh, over uh, a certain horizon associated with these disasters. And I think that the big element of the model that we're gonna emphasize, I think that's not been so appreciated uh, yet, is that uh, there's obviously uh, a huge amount of externality when it comes to mitigation, right? Uh, so there's going to be an under-provision in competitive markets, and this is going to play a pretty big role in terms of thinking about both uh, policy remedies, such as uh, taxes, and then also that's going to allow us to talk about then the impact on asset prices as well, okay? So we're going to compare uh, outcomes in the competitive equilibrium where there's an externality uh, compared to uh, the social plan of outcome. Right. All right, so what are the key results? Uh, the model can be applied for uh, a number. I mean, it's a, it's a very uh, 
generic model in the sense it could be applied for uh, many different types of weather disasters. But I think it's really useful uh, to be very specific. And, and I think we're gonna focus on, on seawalls. And the reason we wanna focus on seawalls is we wanna show that the model is actually fairly simple to calibrate. Uh, even though the model actually is, is quite rich and, and does quite a bit, uh, it's going to be fairly easy, I think, by, by the standards of these types of models to calibrate. And, and hopefully I'll be able to convince you uh, that we can think systematically about the value of seawalls in terms of protecting against uh, more frequent Atlantic hurricanes, right? So 2020, uh, of course, um, there's the pandemic, but it's also been a record year in terms of hurricanes that have made landfall. Uh, uh, basically all across the Americas, right? Uh, you know, I think the Atlantic has got a little bit lucky this year, uh, even though there's been a record number of uh, hurricanes that have made landfall, uh, but uh, you know, our neighbors further south have not been as lucky as you no doubt have, have heard, right? So, so we're gonna talk about the Atlantic, but of course, you know, the model could be uh, applied in, in, in any type of regional level. Uh, so what, what are the results? So I'm gonna to try to convince you that uh, in the Atlantic right now, for, for the Atlantic hurricanes, uh, it makes sense, it's optimal to have a 1.3% housing capital tax to fund mitigation in the form of these seawalls. Uh, welfare is gonna be 25% higher as a result compared to the competitive equilibrium. Okay. Um, that's the first set of results. Uh, the second set of results we're gonna emphasize uh, that that's not as quantitative, but it's more kind of qualitative talking about sort of the, the large literature on, on what happens in the after, aftermath of these disasters uh, is that you know, there's gonna be persistent declines in growth rates due to a learning mechanism in the model, right? So, so that is when the disasters arrive, people also update their beliefs that disasters are more likely in the future, okay? And that's gonna basically generate persistence, uh, persistent decline in growth rates, which is what you typically observe uh, in the uh, in, in, in data, right? But but it's not such an obvious uh, uh, mechanism to get it without. You only look at risk, right? So you do not look at uncertainty, which uh, in in the space of climate science plays a, a big role. So uh, you do not have this effect that potentially uncertainty can be reduced if uh, people learn more about uh, the upcoming risks? Yeah, yeah, no, we don't. So, so I mean, I don't quite know what's the mechanism. So give me a little bit more. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what's the mechanism you have in mind. Well, as we move along, uh, we, we start to learn more about uh, what kind of impact climate change might have. And uh, there, if people are, uncertainty and risk averse, then uh, and uncertainty is reduced on, on what is expecting us, there might be some counter effects. Oh, yeah. So I think that is there in the model. Yeah, so we have a learning model. Uh, in the learning model, uh, what's going to happen is, um, you know, disasters arrive, people update, but there's only really true, there's only two states, it's either like a good state or a bad state. Okay. And so what happens is when arrivals come, uh, people will update, okay? And, and of course, uh, there will also be reductions in uncertainty depending on how sure they are about which state it is. So, so that's going to be in the model. Okay. Maybe um, another question. So you only look at the US, right? So you don't look, for instance, so if, if you think about seawalls, maybe uh, there's some interesting aspect, uh, for instance, in the Netherlands because they have some experience with building seawalls. And also, uh, if you think about disaster models, um, the U.S. might be hit by hurricanes. Europe is not really hit by hurricanes. So these are different uh, problems and there might be some differences when you calibrate these kind of models to, to different regions, which oh, differ a lot. Yeah, yeah totally. I, I think primarily this is a, this is a, uh, uh, a theoretical contribution, um, okay. but it basically is going to be applied to an example of seawalls in the Atlantic. But I completely agree, of course, the numbers could be very different depending on the application of the region, right? Uh, so, so for sure. Um, so I, I think mostly we want to demonstrate um, how to go about calibrating uh, and using the model uh, just in the context of, of the seawalls. I'm not, I'm not even sure if the Atlantic seawall hurricanes are, 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 is the most pressing thing, except that uh, it is kind of realistic. People are discussing it. Uh, there are basically proposals underway. So there are numbers that we can then check 
right, to evaluate whether these, 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 these proposals make any sense. Yeah, okay. Uh, and also, by the way, the other thing is that that's going to lead, Mark, as your comments, good, it's going to lead to a third point. Part of the other reason we chose the seawalls is, is, of course, there's a lot of interest right now in understanding the impact on asset prices, right? Uh, and most of the studies of sea level rise have been focused on the Atlantic. So, so we're going to try to use uh, our model to guide some of this literature. Okay. And, and the, well, what I'll kind of talk about there is that, you know, I think the, uh, the result. So I think there's a view uh, that's a little bit unspoken that, um, you know, which is true that of course, if what's causing externalities uh, is, is exactly production or in the context of, of these disasters, locating your property near like a flood zone, right? Uh, <laughs> these are externalities. And so of course, to, to address them, you're going to have to implement a tax, right? And that of course is gonna get fed back into asset prices. And I think there's a real uh, uh, counter policy worry that you don't wanna do these things because it's kind of obviously bad for existing homeowners, right? But I think this argument we're gonna show, right? Misses this other thing, which is of course, taxes are not just taxes. They bring a huge amount of benefits, right? Because you're building a seawall. I mean, you're just not taxing a guy, you're, you know, you're building a seawall, which of course is gonna make living, right? In the Atlantic, much more attractive. Okay, and so it really requires an equilibrium model to calculate what exactly is the impact on asset prices. So people have been out there kind of running a lot of regressions, trying to figure out what is the impact of expectations about sea level rise on housing prices. But I think what the model basically says is, what do you think ex ante you would get anyways, right? You know what I mean? Uh, uh, in terms of these home prices, right? You, you need to have uh, uh, some model. It's not quite nearly as easy, I think, as you know, a, a, a typical uh, finance study in the sense that, you know, th these are these are things that are very tied to policy, essentially, right? Um, and, and actually what we found that was kind of surprising is that even though we're going to implement a 1.3% housing capital tax to fund the seawall, Atlantic Coastal Property is only lower by 5%, right? Which does not seem like an inordinately large amount. And the reason, of course, is that the seawall really is effective at mitigating aggregate risk. Right, which is a huge benefit associated with, 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 with sustainability. Okay, and so I think that this, this, this part is new, I think, to, to, to the calculation that, um, you know, I think that, uh, uh, I think all of the stuff that people are doing is very exciting uh, in terms of, um, you know, now bringing to bear uh, data. And, and I think hopefully the model can help a little bit in terms of also framing some of those numbers, right, uh, about what, what, what we think we should be getting. So just this kind of a flag, um, in terms of the seawall application, there are actually existing estimates uh, about a, a couple of things. Uh, so typically what you would do to, to model uh, weather disasters uh, is to think about them as like a productivity shock and some effect on long run GDP growth. Right? And, and that's why usually with these studies, uh, people typically scale by GDP. Okay, so, so an example is uh, Nordhaus's uh, 2010 paper on the, the economic damage of hurricanes to the Atlantic, where he compares basically uh, damages in sort of a business as usual scenario, which is, you know, you let basically the path of CO2 and, and temperature continue versus mitigation. But there, what he talks about mitigation is what if we basically change the path of temperature increases, right? Yeah. You know, I think, our, our, I think it is very useful, but I think for us, maybe kind of not uh, uh, necessarily the only adaptation that's gonna happen, right? In other words, you know, uh, a seawall is of course a natural adaptation, right? Uh, uh, that, that these estimates don't have. And so we have to kind of value that. Uh, so, you know, for instance, numbers that you can generate are, are actually fairly large. So there's a there's a, a Shang and Gina paper uh, that puts the PV of um, uh, total losses, assuming a business as usual scenario of something on the order of like ten trillion dollars globally for the impact of hurricanes uh, in terms of uh, economic damages. Okay, uh, so what we so the the way that these guys generate this stuff is 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 um, very different from us. Uh, first, the model is different. They think about these things as productivity shocks. We think about these things as disasters and impact on, on capital. And then second, uh, the way they calculate. Uh, mitigation, of course, is very different. They're thinking about different paths of CO2 emissions, whereas we're mostly thinking about adaptations like seawalls or land use zoning. 
which we, which we think is actually fairly realistic, right? Uh, because these things are obviously very under discussion right now. And I think kind of the third thing is uh, we're going to generate these estimates uh, using a, a, a structural model, a mo an equilibrium model. And that's going to allow us to talk about other things that these guys cannot talk about, for instance, equilibrium asset pricing. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, 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 is, what is the transition risk, right? Uh, so so we, we think it's a very useful, uh, probably in some ways more useful uh, uh, from, from, for the finance community, uh, given our interest in, in, in asset prices and, and, and other issues. Okay, so let me just do a quick primer on the Atlantic hurricanes. Uh, so this is about 46,000 miles uh, that have to be defended in, in, in some sense, right? So we're going to think about this as a region, you know, okay? So U.S. Have, US housing capital stocks about 30 trillion, uh, probably feel 45%, 50% of it is in, 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 in the Atlantic. So that's going to bring you to about 15 trillion, but probably not all of it is at risk. So probably at risk is something like around the order of 8 trillion to 10 trillion. Of, of housing capital stock that's at risk. Okay, so that, that's kind of the, the, the scaling you should have in mind. Uh, so just to give you some numbers, uh, historically, um, there's a pretty big fat tail, the top six most damaging hurricanes. Uh, so there's been about 250 that has made landfall in the last 120 years. Uh, it's about 4% of Atlantic housing capital stock, assuming a $10 trillion 2018 uh, number. Okay, so that's the fat tail, yeah. Uh, conditional damage per arrival is about 40 basis points of, of, of coastal housing capital stock. Uh, this is the number we got from, from the North House paper, right? Uh, so so um, per arrival, right, uh, it's about 40 basis points, not too bad, uh, but there's a big fat tail, okay? And the scenario we're going to imagine is the following, right? In the future, you know, we can think that the expected losses could be 5.5 times that in the sense that Right now, about one to two hurricanes are making landfall. In the future, you might think it could be five times that. Like for instance, in 2020, we've had about in the US, six hurricanes, that have, six and a half hurricanes that have made landfall. And this could be like a new normal, yeah. Okay, so these are kind of the rough numbers that we're gonna have in mind in terms of calibrating uh, our, our, our model about whether or not it's worth it to build a seawall and, 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 and how much we should be spending on building a seawall and what's the implication for our uh, coastal uh, property prices. All right, so this is what a seawall looks like. So apparently this is a nice one. I think this is actually from the Netherlands. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, the proposal right now uh, in the Atlantic region uh, is all of the homeowners are very unhappy, of course, because all the owners of property near the sea want to sue the uh, fossil fuel companies to pay for their seawall. Uh, so we got some numbers. Uh, uh, Something that's like on the order of, it's about $15 million per mile. So, and I think this is a lower number. I think this is probably not a very nice seawall. Uh, so that's about $690 billion. But let's, let's just take that as a number just to focus our discussions. So if we amortize this into an annual payment, uh, that's about plus like 8% depreciation, assuming a very low interest rate of 1%, you're spending about $63 billion annually on a seawall, right? Um, so, you know, if you take the $10 trillion as kind of a base, that's about 60 basis points of, of, of a tax that you're going to basically be uh, spending on a seawall. All right. So, so these are the kind of the numbers that we're going to have in mind. And we're going to use our model to basically evaluate, you know, does it make sense? You know, and if we implement it, uh, what's going to happen to, 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 to property prices? The, the seawall, does it, I mean, I assume it defends against the flooding, but not against the wind speeds and rainfalls. I was just wondering whether the damage, is there a significant component that comes from, you know, winds and rainfall that probably the seawall doesn't help against? Yeah, yeah, no, there is, there is. I, I think most of it, so I'm, you know, I'm not gonna claim that I'm the uh, a world's expert on uh, hurricane damage functions, but uh, I've read some, some stuff, like some PNA, PNAS stuff. So my, my understanding is that most of the damages come from the surge, yeah? Uh, so seawalls will help a lot. Okay. Of course, does not, um, it's, it's, that's subject to change, for instance. So, so for instance, you know, I, I, uh, there can be some hurricanes that come in, they stay a hurt, you know, I think this is to some extent, Katrina was a little bit like that. It just kind of hung around for a while, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, of course, the way that ultimately um, 
cities are going to be dealing with this is through irrigation systems. So you can count this as part of seawalls if you want. Does that make sense? Yes. Right, so Miami right now had some of that experience where I don't think it was a massive surge, but basically the hurricane, I think is Iota, one of the one of the Greek letters came by, just kind of hung around for a while, flooded everything basically. And so now of course Miami is discussing uh, paying for a new irrigation system. Okay, so I, I should probably update and just say seawalls and irrigation systems basically. Um, you can kind of count that, right? Thank you. But, but the seawall is the one that, you know, captures popular imagination, you know, the high tide tax, the seawall tax, the, the, you know, you can see that all the homeowners are the, uh, um, kind of pushing for that. All right, uh, so here's the model. So we're going to do a, an AK model. Uh, let me say two words. So output YT, uh, it's going to be A times KT. So you can think about, obviously, this is a, a generic model. So in the context of property, uh, K is just housing capital stock and YT will be housing services. Yeah. Um, but, you know, more generally, uh, we can think about why is some composite good of housing and, and, and other consumption goods, right? Um, now, the AK model has, has, has pros and cons. Actually, for disasters, we like it a lot uh, because, um, you know, uh, empirically, there does seem to be very persistent effects with the arrival of these disasters as far as the damage of uh, capital, yeah? Uh, so, so this seems like a reasonable model for thinking about uh, these sorts of issues. Um, now, we're going to have a resource constraint. Uh, so with the output, uh, we can spend it on consumption, we can spend it on investment, there's going to be some adjustment costs, and then XT is really going to be this new variable we introduce, uh, which is mitigation spending. Right? This is spending on seawalls. So the capital stock is going to evolve uh, over time. Um, so uh, there is going to be uh, both, there's two types of shocks that will affect capital stock. Uh, one will be sort of these Brownian shocks, DWT, that could affect capital stock. So you can think about Brownians as something like, you know, some of the technology becomes out, some of the capital becomes outdated. Yeah, uh, it could be some positive shocks, could be some negative shocks. Uh, and then the big thing for us is really this, this DJ process. That's going to be the arrival of this disaster. And when a disaster comes, uh, you're going to basically lose a certain amount of capital. Okay, and that's gonna be captured by one minus Z. So Z is the recovery rate, is how much of the capital you recover after the disaster. So one minus Z is gonna be then uh, what the loss of capital with the arrival of the disaster. Okay, and, and we're gonna model uh, these, these, these disasters arrivals as Poisson. So for instance, you know, hurricane arrivals are, are pretty well uh, uh, modeled as like a Poisson process. Um, so Z, the recovery function, uh, the recovery fraction is going to be between zero and one, and then that's going to follow some uh, distribution function, which we'll talk about. Okay. Uh, this is to Marcus's earlier question. So what's the uncertainty? Uh, and, and I think I'm glad that Marcus kind of asked that question because I think that one of the um, important features that, that we think is right in terms of thinking about climate change is there's going to be a lot of learning about how bad climate change is going to be. Uh, with every arrival of every disaster. And I think you're seeing this uh, in real time, you know, for instance, in Miami now, everybody's very serious about building irrigation systems, you know, whereas 10, 15 years ago, people might just be like, no way, I'm not gonna do this, right? So the evidence has come in and despite whatever thing you think people might believe about climate change, you know, uh, disasters have a way of uh, making people uh, wake up pretty quickly. Uh, so there's two possible states, a, a good state G and a bad state B. Uh, so there's going to be two different arrival rates, lambda G and lambda B. Uh, lambda G, the good state is you can think about is what we've talked about historically. Yeah, the numbers I've given you historically, one to two arrivals in the Atlantic. Uh, lambda B could be something like, you know, five times that, 10 times that, right? So these, these are parameters that, that you can use to calibrate the model. And both G and B are absorbing states. Um, and then there's going to be symmetric incomplete information. So you're just going to learn about uh, uh, which, which state you're in. Uh, standard capital adjustment cost functions uh, given by this, this VT uh, process. Uh, so we're going to write everything uh, in terms of homogeneous and blue one. So everything is going to get scaled by capital, essentially. So the big thing, uh, really the big thing we bring to the model is, 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 is we're gonna 
uh, model the post-jump recovery fraction Z as a function of ex anti mitigation spending before the jump. Yeah. So by spending today some fraction of your uh, output, right, uh, that's going to be given by this, this x t minus minus is before the jump, and this is going to be scale by capital. Uh, you'll be able to basically change, right, uh, the distribution function of the recovery fraction. Okay. Uh, and, and we're going to uh, uh, assume that if mitigation x doubles, the benefit of mitigation also doubles. Okay, so, so this is a particular technology, which, which we think is sort of a reasonable one uh, for, for thinking about these disasters. Uh, but otherwise, the rest of the model is fairly standard. Um, you know, these, these uh, we're going to do these uh, uh, Duffy Epstein zine. Uh, Duffy Epstein uh, preferences uh, with recursive utility. So these are uh, non-expected utility preferences uh, given by uh, uh, this, this F function here, okay? Where uh, we're gonna be able to decompose uh, different uh, parameters in the uh, uh, preference, in the preference function, uh, the rate of time preference, the elasticity of intertemporal substitution, the coefficient of relative risk aversion, Okay, uh, so basically the, the CRA is, a, is just a special case. I'm going to flag one thing. The elasticity of intertemporal substitution is really the only key parameter uh, in the calibration, which I'm going to talk about, right? Uh, and this is kind of well understood from, from uh, it's, it's the long run risk literature. All right, uh, so how's the learning go? So the learning is pretty easy, the process. So if, if, if there's no disaster, you drift towards the good state. When there's a disaster, you move towards the bad state. Okay, right. Uh, otherwise, beliefs are a martingale. Of course, you know uh, household beliefs may be a little bit uh, uh, not 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 so rational, but that's easy. That that's an easy fix in this in this model. You can kind of create some some uh, uh, learning bias parameter. So that, that's not a problem. Right. So we'll stay with uh, uh, belief pi as being a martingale. Okay. Um, so let me just kind of show you. So this is what the belief process looks like. So uh, red is the jumps. Okay. And so what's going to happen is this is starting at a prior point one, right? So if there's no disaster, you drift down. You think, well, it's it's good state, right? So you put zero probably on a bad state. But when a jump comes, you just jump right up because uh, the signal is discrete. So the belief will jump. Okay. Uh, and then it kind of comes back down and then it kind of goes up and then it comes back down. Um, this is just a side point, which is sort of an interesting, I'll kind of make, make a comment. Uh, this is a side point, it's not really the focus, is that there's a, you know, if you look at the environmental literature, and now it's becoming more also into the finance literature, right? There's a lot in trying to understand how people learn from the arrival of disasters, right? And I think kind of one of the prominent features that people find is that, you know, a disaster kind of wakes people up and makes them want to buy insurance, but there's a pretty quick, reversion, right? That, that you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, there's a kind of, in some sense, it looks like an overreaction of sorts, right? Yeah. Uh, now, I think that's typically attributed to some notion of uh, overreaction, which is, I think, totally plausible, but it's also uh, 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 a feature, if you will, of that disasters when they arrive are discrete, and therefore, you're going to also get basically this like no news is no disaster is kind of like good news effect that there's going to also be some new version. So the only way you really get beliefs of people to scale up, like to go from like a point one to a one, is you really need a cluster of arrivals of disasters. Yeah, right. It can't just be one, and then you don't see one in five years. You know, of course, then it's just going to kind of come back down. Right. Uh, so if you see like every year for a few years in a row, you know, flooding in Miami, you know, this belief will just really shoot up. And we think that's realistic, actually, because uh, I think that's what you're beginning to see uh, in terms of uh, uh, why there's been such a kind of a, a, a sea change in terms of beliefs about climate change. You know, you're getting multiple years now of the wildfires in California, right? Uh, you're now getting much, much more hurricanes making landfall. Uh, so I think these are all part of the, 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 the updating of the arrival process of these disasters. Uh, otherwise, uh, fairly standard um, stuff. You know, we're going to calculate the. Uh, we're going to use the uh, HAB equation. Uh, it's a very standard HAB equation. So there's only really kind of the big new term is with this uh, lambda pi, which is the arrival rate of a disaster, 
right? Where when the disaster comes, you're going to get a basically a discrete jump in terms of the value function, right? Because when the disaster comes, right, uh, you're going to get both a belief effect, belief jumps, right? And also you're going to get a jump in terms of the, 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 the capital stock, right? In terms, depending on how much you recover. Okay. Uh, some first order investment, uh, first order condition for the investment, first order conditions for the mitigation. The investment is usually that's basically your standard Q stuff. Uh, uh, the, the interesting thing we're bringing to the table is really the calculating basically the, the mitigation. Okay. Can I just quickly ask a short question, Harrison? So I, I, I'm, I'm definitely not a financial economist, but I always get a little bit confused about the notion of adaption policies and mitigation policies. So mm -hmm. I think uh, in your case, wouldn't that be more like a, a, an adaption policy? So basically, central planner tries to reduce the negative impact of climate change, but is not necessarily imposing some conditions on the economy that would help to change the negative impact of climate change in the long run uh, by, you know, subsidizing uh, technology, innovation, and so on and so oh, forth. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I think the words mitigation and adaptation are kind of the same. I mean, it, I mean, they're, they're, I, I view them as sort of in, in the context of our model, uh, um, fairly interchangeable. And so that's kind of just, and I think the literature uses them a, a bit interchangeably as well, uh, in the sense that um, you know, whether like, you know, so for instance, you know, when Nordhaus talks about, um, I think adaptation is kind of broader in the sense that, you know, for instance, with crop yields, right? Yeah. If you can't grow certain crops, you just switch to some other crop, right? That's an adaptation. Another adaptation could be you move away from the coast, right? That's an adaptation. Mitigation is no, I don't want to move away from the coast. I'm going to stay at the coast, right? I'm just going to try to mitigate my damages. So, you know, I, mitigation is a subset of adaptation. And so that, I would just kind of say that. Um, now, probably have some different impact on, on the optimization problem, depending on how you define yeah. exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So for instance, if we introduced another sector into the model, right? Let's say people could move away from the coast or like redeploy their capital, right? To some other means, make other types of investments. That would be an adaptation, right? So of course people are going to do both. There's going to be both adapt. You know, I mean, adaptation is just the general word. You know, because like I think you know you can think about mitigation as also a type of adaptation, right? You know, in the sense that adaptation just means you're changing, right? you're adapting to the environment, you're adapting to a changing environment. Um, now I think to your other question, um, it's going to become, of course, we're not dealing with. Uh, so here we're we're explicitly mostly interested in what I guess I would call local mitigation or regional level mitigation, as opposed to a global solution, which is the control, right, uh, the temperature path. Yeah. So that's why I was really emphasizing this is regional. Right. So for instance, you know, the state of California, this is funny, you know, like, uh, I'll make it as a side, I'll put this as a video. So I don't know if I should say all these things. So like the, the state of California, uh, you know, interestingly talks about the wildfires is that, well, we have to get our emissions under control which is kind of a, a little bit crazy because obviously the state of California as, as wonderful and big as it is, is not gonna have much of an effect on global temperature paths. And you know, what a very complex, you know, weather systems, right? right? You know, what the state of California needs to deal with is more what our model is addressing, which is land use regulation. Yeah, you know, don't let people build, you know, in urban wildlife interfaces because obviously then you're gonna run into a host of wildfire problems. So it's much, so, the, so the, the California wildfire problem is much closer to a hurricane problem, right? Than it is to like an emissions, controlling emissions problem. I mean, no matter what California does, it's not gonna affect the path of global emissions. Right? Uh, it's, not, it's not really going to affect, uh, 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 unless you can get China, unless you can get all these other countries on board. You know what I mean? Uh, so I, I view these things as kind of, uh, obviously they're related, but, but they're not, you know, they're, 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 they require uh, 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 different solutions and, and, and different models. Does that make sense? Right. So, so I'm very focused on just the regional level uh, of mitigation. Now, but as far as the economics, we're going to get exactly kind of the same notion, which is the central planner, right? Since 
and let, I'm gonna about to get to this, right? So since there's an externality, the central planner is going to want to uh, impose a tax. All right, so most of the stuff, there's only kind of really two, most of the stuff is, is fairly uh, um, in the literature already if, if you're kind of working with these types of uh, uh, macro growth models. I think the, the kind of the two new things we're bringing, of course, is the learning piece, which is sort of markets that have alluded to. And then this is the other piece, which is uh, the mitigation of the fat tail damages. Okay. And then also particularly like the, 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 the way we're kind of putting into the model, I think is very important because it's gonna speak exactly exact to externalities. So, so here's what's gonna happen, right? So um, a, disaster, uh, a disaster arrives, right? According to this Poisson process, conditional on arrival, then you draw from a power law distribution for damages. Yeah? Okay, so that, that's no problem. I mean, that's a very, uh, 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 um, that's a very you know, traditional way that one thinks about modeling damages of, of, of these disasters and hurricanes. And so the power law, Z, uh, so Z basically is the recovery fraction. So the, the power law is really, X is gonna mitigate this, this beta, right? That's the power law, okay? And what's nice about um, the formulation we're going to have is, is the following, is that you're going to be able to just really transparently and see exactly what the technology is doing. Right? So it's not going to be sort of very complicated. So, so by modeling it this way, what's going to happen is conditional on a jump arrival. The expected fractional loss of capital stock is going to be given by L. Right? And L pi, right? Pi is your perceived risk of where, how, you know, uh, of where you are between the good state and the bad state, right? And your loss conditional on a jump is then just gonna be one over this power of this beta to the X pi plus one, right? So, so what's gonna happen is by doing mitigation spending, okay? You're gonna basically reduce uh, your losses uh, uh, conditional on a jump. And this is exactly how much you can kind of figure out uh, is, is, the, is the reduction in terms of your your, your loss of capital. And then the growth rate in the economy, uh, G is then just gonna be whatever you're investing in, 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 in capital minus then uh, the expected arrival of these disasters times uh, the conditional damage per arrival. So L is the expected damage per arrival. Yeah, okay. Um, so, so that's it. Uh, so, so that's how we're gonna calibrate. So we're gonna basically, you know, all of this stuff is observable in the data. So we know what the loss distribution looks like for these hurricanes, right? Uh, we know how many hurricanes are coming, uh, what, we, what, what, we should be, what we should be expecting as the arrival rate uh, per year. Um, okay, uh, so we're gonna make a, a simple calibration. So we're gonna do a linear specification for beta. You know, this is the part where we don't have much of a sense of what that technology looks like. I think in the future, uh, we might, uh, but for now, we're just going to basically uh, uh, have a linear specification of beta zero plus beta one X. And uh, so you can think about it this way. So beta zero is uh, if you spend zero on mitigation, beta zero is the power law that governs uh, uh, the, the losses uh, per uh, conditional on arrival. So that's easy because beta zero, you can calibrate from the historical data. So we're gonna pretend that in the past, X was zero, nobody's spending, right? Yeah. Okay. So we can kind of just match up with the historical hurricane loss distributions, beta zero. Okay, that, that's gonna be easy. Uh, and then beta one is, is the trick. So this is the trick to the entire exercise. Okay, so um, how do we think about beta one? Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to pick beta one such that even if the technology was available in the past, you would not want to spend. Okay. So that that's the way we're going to pin down uh, the beta one parameter. Um, okay. So, so that's it. I mean, I think basically uh, we have all the pieces now to talk about uh, uh, the seawall mitigation problem. Um, all right, so uh, a couple of other notation, I think we're good. So uh, we're gonna calculate the planner's value function with mitigation, right? So that's gonna be given by this form. So B pi is gonna be the certainty wealth equivalent, right? It's a measure of welfare basically, right? Uh, and then we're gonna have the value function without mitigation. So that i.e. beta one is zero. 
That's going to be B hat. This is going to correspond to the competitive equilibrium. Okay, because what's happening is we've put the technology of mitigation, right, to minimize aggregate risk. Okay, uh, but individually, households don't have an incentive to really invest in this type of mitigation. Right, and this is the nature of the market failure of the model that uh, the competitive equilibrium solution. Right, essentially is the planner solution only basically where there's no mitigation technology available. Right? Uh, so the welfare theorem fails uh, in this economy. Uh, and, and, and it's the way we've kind of installed mitigation is that it reduces aggregate risk. Uh, uh, uh. So, you know, two, two comments, I think from the point of view of externalities. I mean, everybody kind of in environmental economics kind of understands externalities at some level, right? In terms of, you know, trying to equate uh, the social costs of production with, 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 with the marginal benefits of production. The way we're doing it is in terms of risk, right? So, so what's happening is the following. When you build a home in the Atlantic, near the Atlantic, right? That home generates essentially a negative externality, right? Um, because you're basically putting yourself, you know, uh, near the path of these hurricanes and, you know, being destroyed, which is bad for social welfare. Individually, no one has an incentive to spend on mitigation. The planner is going to want to spend on mitigation. If you're going to locate, so we don't allow people not to locate. If you're going to be on the coast, the planner is going to want to spend on mitigation because that's better for social welfare. But individually, because it's a seawall, et cetera, there's just an externality. Guys don't want to basically, uh, there's always a free riding problem. Right? Uh, and, and, and so therefore, coastal property Absent mitigation is, from a social planner perspective, too risky, which is bad for welfare. Yeah, you know, building cities in areas that are going to flood is just too risky from a social planner's perspective. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, so then uh, we can calculate then the welfare loss. Uh, in the planner versus the competitive equilibrium. Uh, and that essentially then will be the willingness to pay for mitigation. Right. Okay. Um, so we can quantify, you know, how much better off would society be uh, uh, in the planner's outcome versus uh, in the first best versus the competitive solution. Uh, and that difference is also then your willingness to pay for basically uh, this, this mitigation technology. All right. Um, so let me talk about then the, the parameters, how we do the calibration. Uh, I mentioned earlier this elasticity of intertemporal substitution is, is kind of the key kind of a, a, a preference parameter. We're going to set that at 1.1. So the literature is kind of all over the place on this, on this parameter value. Uh, one is, is, is a typical benchmark. Uh, guys who do asset pricing prefer a number bigger than one. Uh, Microeconomists prefer a number less than one. Uh, we're going to pick a number slightly above one, basically, as, 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 a, as, a, as a reasonable number. I, I think this is a, it's an okay number for thinking about the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. Um, the, the power law exponent with no mitigation is going to be this number 246. This is set to match the historical loss function, the, the distribution of losses. Lambda G is one, right? So historically, the arrival rate per year of a disaster of a hurricane is something like one to two. We're going to just pick one. The bad state we're gonna say is 10. So I think 2020 is turning out to be about 6.5, let's say, right? Okay. So we just, the, the, the B is not so important. We just wanna have a spread so that there's room for people to learn about, you know, uh, how bad things can be, right? But you know, 10 is not a crazy number as like a bad, bad state. Um, number of hurricanes to make landfall. Uh, then time rate of preference productivity, uh, the adjustment cost parameter, coefficient of relative risk aversion, capital diffusion volatility, these will be all set to match these observables without mitigation, which is the risk-free rate, the housing return risk premium, the housing market return volatility, the expected growth rate, and Tobin's Q, uh, which we, we set to be two. So Tobin's Q is the price of, of uh, a, a unit of capital, right, of, of housing. And then, as I said, the trick is we're going to set basically the, the, the mitigation technology parameter beta one so that uh, even if it was available to the social planner, 
he'll basically spend zero on it uh, if he thinks that uh, he's in a good state. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so that's it. So I think basically now we can talk about uh, the, the 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 outcomes. Um, so let's talk about first the red line, which is the competitive solution. So the red line X was spending on mitigation. So there's an externality. Guess what? Nobody spends, right? It's zero. Pi is on the x-axis. That's telling you how bad things are going to be in terms of these hurricane arrivals, right? One would be 10 hurricanes a year. Zero is one hurricane a year. So I'm going to kind of put you at about 0.5, which is you know roughly how many hurricanes we had this year, right? Like six and a half. So investment uh, is falling, uh, not surprisingly, with pi, but not that much, right? So obviously, uh, if there's greater risk, people are not going to want to invest as much in housing capital, right? If they know that their capital is going to get destroyed at an increasing frequency, okay? And uh, because this is a general equilibrium model, uh, nobody can kind of do anything. So therefore, what's going to happen is people are just going to consume. Right, in the competitive equilibrium. They'll, they'll just purchase some consumption. They'll just uh, uh, do some consumption. Q, which is the price per unit of housing capital falls a bit, but not too much. Uh, it's gonna go from a two to a 1.95. So one of the things I'm gonna say is the following is that, you know, we were, we, it's right, we should basically try to understand the impact of climate change on coastal property value and so the, the New York Times loves like doing this, you know, like every time I turn to New York Times, they love profiling a paper that indicates that everybody's about to flee Miami and Miami property prices is about to collapse, which of course never happens. So you talk to the real estate agents, everybody's like, people love Miami, right? Um, because, you know, if you're basically, so what I think what this model is saying is that, look, if, if you have uh, uh, um, no mitigation, Right, um, beliefs alone can only drive a certain fraction of, of 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 the drop in property prices, and kind of not all that much because it really depends on the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. Right. Okay. So it's not an obvious call that you're going to get just basically based on beliefs. These massive drops in home prices. Now, if you look at the planner, the planner is going to want to spend. Right, he's going to want to spend on mitigation. That's X. X, by the way, is also going to be the tax. Right, if you were to implement the planner's solution, right, in a competitive market, you're going to tax capital, and you're going to basically subsidize mitigation with that tax, which is, i.e., exactly what you're doing with a seawall. You're going to tax housing at here. If you take 0.5, it's going to be 1.3 percent, and then you're going to take that money and spend it on seawall protection. Yeah. Then what's going to happen, of course, is investment will be lower. Of course, it has to be lower because there's an externality to locating in the coast. The planner doesn't want so much property on the coast. Yeah. So there will be, of course, less consumption, right? Because you know you have to spend on the seawall, and of course, property prices will fall. And actually, it's going to fall much more than if you did not have a tax, right? So you see that it's going to go from a Q of two to a, a Q of like a 1.88886. Now, the difference between the red and the blue line is the impact of a seawall tax on property prices, which is about 5%. Okay. Which is, is, is a bit surprising if you're going to, you know, and, and I think why, you know, if, you, if you're going to simply do a tax, right, a 1.3% tax is not a small tax. And yet it's not really dropping property prices all that much. And the reason is exactly because uh, mitigation reduces aggregate risk. It makes owning coastal property less risky. Yeah. So there's basically this, this countervailing mitigation effect associated uh, with, 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 with a seawall. So, so, so that, you know, it's not just simply uh, all the costs associated with implementing, right? And I think the same discussion is true, by the way, um, 
with, with fossil fuel companies. You know, like people talk about fossil fuel companies and everybody says, well, look, there's gonna be a tax on fossil fuel, their prices are gonna fall, it's gonna be a disaster. Maybe yes. But on the other hand, you know, uh, less lower risk of major disasters disrupting all of their production is a benefit, right? You know, uh, you know, so it depends on the context that you're talking about, right? So, so you know, there can be offsetting effects associated with uh, 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 these benefits. It depends on the sector, it depends on, et cetera. In the case of housing, it's pretty clear, um, there's a huge benefit associated with uh, uh, seawalls and that's gonna really help protect property prices. So of course, you know, the planner doesn't want as much property in the coast. But with mitigation, uh, you'll only get a modest drop in, 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 in property prices, right, a 5%. So this is not like the end of the world kind of stuff, essentially. So Miami is okay, right? If Miami spends 1.3% on irrigation and, and, and um, seawalls, you know, it should be okay. And I guess the Netherlands is sort of an example of that, right? Yeah, that, you know, obviously people have lived uh, uh, quite successfully uh, uh, near, near high sea levels. And, and I guess some, somebody in the Netherlands at some point in time must have made some really wise decisions on investing on a seawall. So do these numbers also depend a lot on uh, your assumptions, especially about the discount rate? Because in the literature on the social cost of carbon, if you go from 5% to 2.5%, you basically increase the social cost of carbon by a factor of three. Would that also be the case uh, in your analysis? Uh, yeah, we're assuming really low interest rates already. Um, yeah, it depends, of course. Uh, there, there are people that say, okay, you should use uh, the market, uh, the interest rates in the financial markets. And when you do macroeconomic models, or if you talk about climate, you should take. Uh, yeah, so. Rate. There is this big discussion, right? Yeah, no. So, I mean, so let me, I'll, let me, let me sort of talk about it. So, in, in the context of uh, the social cost of carbon, um, Two, two things. So first, of course, um, there's, there's, there's no, um, you know, I mean, there's different versions of this discussion we can have, I guess, but there's no mitigation in those models, right? So, you know, it's like the, the, the way, the way the typical model goes is that uh, if you don't, you know, if the path goes up, there's an assumption about the damage to output, right? you know, through a, through a productivity term, right? This is the so-called climate damage function. Um, but, you know, these models, so the, the only mitigation is essentially, uh, you want to reverse the path of temperature, right? Okay, and then, you know, then you'll basically go, well, the social cost of carbon uh, will, will be X, right? Um, now, how would I kind of talk about that in the context of mitigation? So people would say, well, okay. Um, if I were to think purely about that the output loss in these models is coming from these disasters that are affecting property and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Then you should introduce a different option for the planner, which is seawalls. You know, that, that, that's a different adaptation that you can do. So in other words, the damage function that they're hardwiring in uh, misses these types of mitigation, these types of regional level mitigation that you could have, yeah. Um, so I guess that, that would be the way I would kind of link this up into that, that analysis. Uh, so for us, there's not, um, we, we, this is kind of a, a full-blown G model. So, you know, you can definitely change the, 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 the interest rates and all that stuff. I'm not sure that it's that sensitive. We haven't checked, we haven't checked all the parameters, but we're basically assuming a fairly low uh, interest rate in this calibration, I think, right? So we're targeting like 0.8%, basically. Um, and I, I think that the reason um, 
the social, so the, the, this drop in Q, right, is the, in some sense the social cost of coastal property, right? Uh, and, and, and the whole point is that mitigation actually generates, local, local mitigation generates a huge amount of value, essentially, which is not really modeled when you think about uh, the, the, the standard damage function with the temperature, right? Yeah, because they're a little bit amorphous about what exactly is the damage, right? They're kind of lumping in many things, some of which may be disasters, some of which I think they think of as like labor supply, right? But I think the guys who study this stuff would argue, well, that's why you have better air conditioning, right? Yeah. And you should model that in, in terms of mitigation spending. So what if we double the investment in, 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 in other types of mitigatory activities, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So, okay. Um, the, the planner, so in the red line, the market suffers quite a large welfare loss of nearly, uh, uh, 35% relative to pi with zero. Um, but of course, because of mitigation, the planner is not nearly as bad off. It's only about 15%. So the difference is 20, 25%. That's the value of technology. That's the value of this mitigation, right? And um, the conditional damage, remember we calibrated is about uh, in a good state, um, was about um, 40 bips per arrival. That's the same. But remember, you know, now we're getting hit with like, you know, 5.5 times of this, right? Yeah, that's kind of the, what, what essentially we're saying when pi is like 0.5, right? Uh, now about mitigation though, you basically reduce uh, these, these, these fat tail, you know, these expected damages from about 40 basis points per arrival down to almost like uh, uh, 15 basis points per arrival. As a result, the expected growth rate will be higher right, relative to uh, uh, the competitive. Rate.